often talk about very old people on this channel. What I mean by that is that we usually talk about people who lived like in the Middle Ages or like really long time ago, but we must not forget that there are also very significant and important figures that have appeared very recently in history and even perhaps today that have affected the world of religion in, in significant ways. And one of the most inspirational and impactful figures in the Islamic world in the last century or so is the Senegalese Sufi saint and social revolutionary. Revolutionary Amadou Bamba. He not only serves as a great example of West African Sufism or Islam in general, but also as a figure who resisted French colonialism, but did so through non-violence, a peaceful approach that was, probably for that reason, very successful. So let's explore one of the most significant Muslim personalities in recent memory and the Sufi order that he started. Islam in West Africa is a really fascinating topic, especially when it comes to Sufism. Indeed, in some ways, the situation in countries like Senegal or the Gambia kind of mirrors the way that much of the Islamic world looked for most of history, with Sufism playing a major role in religious, social, and political life. Not only are these countries overwhelming the Muslim in their demographics, also, according to Pew Research Center only a few years ago, 92% of Muslims in Senegal are affiliated with a Sufi Brotherhood. And the numbers are similar in neighboring countries as well. This may be surprising to many people who assume that Sufism is some small sect, but this is what the situation has been like, or at least similar to this, is what the situation has been like for most of history and in many places still today, as we can obviously see here. It's perhaps no surprise then why I did both my bachelor's and master's theses on West African Sufism and spent extended periods of time with the Sufi brotherhoods there. In any case, among the two most prominent Sufi orders in Senegambia, that is Senegal and the Gambia, is the Muridiya, which has significant political and social influence and was founded relatively recently by the 20th century figure Amadou Bamba. In most ways, the order is based on his teachings of non-violence, peace, education, and an emphasis on a strong work ethic, and is still led by his descendants to this day. I've actually met one of his grandsons myself, just a little side note bragging. Anyway, who was Amadou Bamba then? Let's explore his life and his teachings. Amadou Bamba Mbake was born in Senegal in 1853, in what were very uncertain and unstable times. His birth and upbringing coincided with some very significant events in the country, primarily the gradual colonization and takeover by France, who would come to rule the region for the better part of a century. In other words, Bamba grew up in an environment that was filled with conflict, war, and tensions. The French colonial power started a program of assimilation, where the locals were put in French schools to learn the French language, conform to quote-unquote French culture, and eventually become Frenchmen, hopefully. This naturally also comes with an eroding and erasing of much of the local traditions and cultures. As you might imagine, and as is usually the case, the Senegalese people weren't very happy with these developments, and various forms of resistance erupted. Senegal at this time was a diverse place. There were many different tribes and tribal chiefs, both pagan and Muslim, that ruled different regions. Islam had made its way into the area gradually over the centuries, but really started to gain a foothold when the different Sufi orders started to make headway there. In the late 18th century, the Qadri order started spreading in Senegal, and in the 19th century, the Tijaniya also became very popular. Reactions from Muslim spiritual leaders and scholars, or marabouts as they are often known there, to the arrival of the French would vary. Some were more positively inclined towards the French, or at least promoted peaceful coexistence rather than active resistance, such as the popular Tijani figure al Hajj Malik Si, and many other Qadri sheikhs as well. Others, however, chose to fight back in the form of armed jihad, to drive out the occupying Europeans. 
Amadabamba and his family lived in a region that became a hotbed for this activity. Various religious and political leaders took up arms against the French and a lot of violence erupted. Not only did the locals fight the French, but various tribal chiefs and local rulers also started fighting each other over land or influence, sometimes as proxies for the other sides who were fighting. It was a, a mess in many different ways. Growing up, Amadobamba would have witnessed firsthand the devastation and ugliness of war, and he even lost family members, including young siblings. His family were not warriors. Indeed, Bamba came from a line of religious scholars, and his father was a very well-respected expert on the Qur'an and Islamic law. At a young age and in the midst of all the chaos, Amadou was given a thorough education in all the religious sciences, memorizing all of the Quran, studying the hadiths of the Prophet, and learning the principles of jurisprudence, especially the Maliki school of law that was most prominent in this region. He would also study Sufism to some degree, but that journey would begin in earnest later on. Even though he and his family stayed out of politics as such, they were kind of drawn into the conflict anyway when his father was given the position of judge and chief advisor to La Jor, a local king who became one of the key and last players in armed resistance against the French. As Amadou Bamba reached early adulthood and became something of a scholar himself, he worked as assistant to his father in this position, although later chroniclers will often state that he was very unhappy with the fact that his father was working so closely with a political figure and only supported him because of filial piety, essentially. Already very knowledgeable and with a real talent for rhetoric, Bamba had already sort of started having people come to him for answers to their questions. People were drawn to him, his character and his wisdom. Even at this point, sources claim that he was showing some serious interest in spiritual matters. He would often go away into nature for extended periods to contemplate or to pray. He had also already started to write spiritual poetry in Arabic, something that he would become very famous for later. But it wasn't until his father's death in 1883, when he would have been 30 years old, that Bamba's spiritual quest really started for real, so to say. Uh, he seems to have immediately sort of broken ties with all the political leaders, including La Jor, and instead went on a spiritual journey. He had already been initiated into the Qadri Sufi order, either by his father or his uncle, and was of course involved with Sufism, because basically everyone was, but uh, at this time he started taking this path very seriously, and he even went on a journey. He traveled away to Mauritania, which was a center for a scholarship and a center also for Sufism at this time. In these travels, he perfected his knowledge of the religious sciences even more and focused especially on Sufism or Tasawwuf in Arabic, the mystical or inner purification of the heart to reach intimacy with God. He met with many sheikhs or masters, including one of the foremost teachers of the Qadri order and trained under them until he himself had become a sheikh, a spiritual master. But it is said that he was also initiated into several other Sufi orders at this time too, the Shadiliya and the Tijaniya. In other words, he really became deeply involved in Sufism. Once he had returned to Senegal and his family, he did so no longer just as a respected scholar, but as a realized Sufi teacher who immediately started attracting devoted followers. This is the start of the community that would eventually grow into one of the most major Sufi brotherhoods in the world. When La Jor was finally defeated in 1886, the French hoped that they had finally stamped out all resistance in the region and could thus complete their process of domination in the region. In some ways they were right, because it is from this point that they essentially held absolute power over all of what we call Senegal today. But as Amadou Bamba started to amass an increasing number of followers and thus gaining an incredible amount of power, the French eventually started getting really nervous about him. As his reputation spread, his status increased even more. Through his spiritual charisma, knowledge of the religion, and devotion to the Prophet Muhammad, he soon started to be considered the Mujadid, or reviver of the religion for that century. So for context, there is a hadith that states that in every century there will come a reviver that will, well, revive the religion of Islam. And many of his followers considered Amadou Bamba to be that reviver for that century. 
Not only this, but he was also considered the Qutb al-Zaman, or the pole of the age, a title of spiritual pole of the world around which everything turns, as well as being called the Khadim al-Rasul, the servant of the messenger, referring to his devotion to the Prophet Muhammad in particular. And indeed, Amud Bamba had not just amassed a group of followers, in a way he had actually started a movement, a movement of education and spiritual development that aimed to transform its followers. There are many stories about his practices and teachings at this time. He would often go away on long spiritual retreats by himself. He would also spend time teaching his followers and, and instructing them on the spiritual way. He would also set up his system of education and he would write a lot and a lot of poetry. This poetry is often very instructional, so sort of instructions again on this, how to follow the spiritual path, but also a lot of praise poems to the Prophet Muhammad or to God. As part of this spiritual mission, he founded two cities or villages at that time, one which was called Darussalam, the abode of peace, and another called Tuba, which means blessing and is probably referring to a tree in paradise in the Islamic tradition called Tuba, which in Sufism has often come to represent spiritual perfection. Especially the latter city, Tuba, was very dear to Bamba. He had been looking for a place to found a spiritual center and found it when he was out on a retreat and suddenly had a vision of light while he was praying under a tree. Subsequently, he founded the city Tuba there, which became the center of his movement from then on. He commemorated the founding of the city with the following verses, quote, O God, my Lord, I pray unto you to make this blessed city a place of peace and safety by the grace of the Prophet. I pray unto you to make this blessed city a place of worship, faith, and righteousness, and a place to acquire knowledge. I pray unto you to make this city a garden of Eden for every worshipper, and a place guarded from every outcast demon. I pray unto you to make this city a place which will grant the benefit of the pilgrimage to any believer who wants to go to Mecca but cannot afford it. I pray unto you to forgive the past and future sins of the dwellers of Tuba and of whosoever visits it in search of fulfillment. Amin God, O oh God, Amin, O oh God. The city of Tuba, founded by Ahmadu Bamba, is today the second largest city in all of Senegal and the center for his followers even to this day. In a way, you can kind of understand why the French were a little nervous. Here is this marabout, or religious leader, who is gaining more and more followers and founding cities basically out in the middle of nowhere, where all of these followers can gather together to, to listen to his teachings. Some French-friendly locals in the region reported, probably accurately, that Bamba could have amassed an army of thousands of people at any time if he so wished. Even though informants for the French reported that Bamba was benign, they still saw him as a great threat to their power. A marabout with this much power could very easily turn into another movement of armed jihad or resistance. The thing is, they weren't entirely wrong. Ahmad Bamba was indeed engaged in jihad even to some degree jihad against the colonial powers, and he claimed so himself. But his jihad was not one of armed conflict or war. Instead, his was a jihad of non-violence, a jihad of the soul, and as he called it, a jihad of the pen. Here it is useful to get a bit of a broader perspective of what jihad actually means, because I can feel that some of you are a little confused right now. Jihad does not translate to holy war, as I'm sure most of you know. It literally means struggle or striving and can refer to many different things. In the Quran, jihad is basically never used to refer to war or violence directly. Instead, jihad in general means to strive for one's religion. That can mean to strive or struggle for peace, of being kind. There is environmental jihad that is fighting against climate change. The Sufis in particular like to use the term jihad and nafs, or the struggle against the self or the ego, to denote the spiritual struggle of fighting your negative drives and ego-driven behaviors and to purify the soul. And jihad can also mean struggle in the form of armed struggle or war for the sake of religion, which many people are familiar with. That is indeed one aspect of what jihad can mean. Now we can talk more about the concept of jihad in a separate episode dedicated to it, but what is important to remember here is that jihad is a much broader term than what is usually imagined, and armed conflict is only one of those meanings. 
So in this way, Amado Bamba was fighting a jihad, but it was a jihad of education and refinement of character. For the rest of his life, he would stay devoted to a non-violent cause as the only alternative to reach a peaceful society in this case, making him similar to other 20th century figures like Gandhi and Martin Luther King. The practical part of his jihad was based on education. The movement he had started, and which was centered in places like Darussalam and Tuba, was one based on an educational system called Tarbiya. It was not only a Sufi order in the traditional sense, a master-student relationship where these students would travel on the spiritual path to intimacy with God, it was that too, but also a much more comprehensive system where the students were educated in the basics of the religion, they were taught things like Quran and Hadith, the jurisprudence, but also a deeper spiritual education aimed at transforming the person and society from the inside. Through the Sufi technologies of the heart, this would create a firm basis for ethical human beings, people who are kind, righteous, and embodied all the positive aspects of the Islamic ideals. In the words of Michel R. Kimball, quote, The focus of tarbiya is to groom participants who are distinguished and self-motivated to strive for excellence, have a sense of mission, conduct a balanced life, live in peace with themselves and their environment, and gain discernment with the necessary knowledge, understanding, and skills to make a difference in society by taking an active role, both individually and collectively, in the reform process that seeks to better the community, the country, and the world. Ahmed Bamba's movement was also one that was radical in other ways for the culture in the region at the time. He would take on basically anyone as a student, and progression in the hierarchy was based on merit and level of devotion, rather than social standing in the sort of caste and tribal system of Senegal. Slaves and griots, local musicians and praise singers, could become sheikhs and masters. Basically anyone was welcome as part of his movements, the members of which were known as murids, a common word in Sufism meaning something like student, or more literally a seeker after God. It is also this designation that became the basis for the name of the order that he founded, the muridiya, or murid order. Even though Bamba was a renunciate to some degree, and Sufism obviously involved a certain level of asceticism, his brotherhood was also one that emphasized an active participation in society. Bamba himself had a family, and he encouraged his followers to have a profession to be able to provide and nurture for their families. This was important in order to live a fully spiritual life, according to him. In particular, the murids became known for their strong work ethic and their prominence in producing peanuts. It is true that the Murid community had a certain level of self-sufficiency as one of its goals. All of this not only worried the French, of course, but also angered a lot of the local chiefs and leaders who didn't like that Bamba was collapsing some of the hierarchies and sort of caste system that existed in this region at the time. And so they all sort of gathered together to paint him as the enemy. Uh, many of the locals reported to the French that Bamba was gathering weapons to prepare for war. And even though you know, the French sent people to uh, search through the communities, uh, the, the community of Amado Bamba, they found nothing, but still the process had already started. That is, Amado Bamba was a threat to the colonial powers, and something needed to be done about it. This culminated in 1895, when the French decided to have Bamba arrested and tried. This starts a new phase in his life. A phase when he not only passively fights his jihad of the pen, but starts being actively persecuted by the colonial powers, and yet continues to fight his non-violent pacifist struggle against them. His dedication to this cause is clear from his own statements, in which he makes it clear that his understanding of Islam and his dedication to the Prophet is what is ensuring him that non-violence is the only correct path. As he is taken to a cell awaiting trial in San Luis, the capital, he wrote, quote, Each time I recall this night, this governor and the ignominy, I felt like having recourse to arms. But Al-Mahdi, the eraser of sins and pains, the Prophet, peace be upon him, forbade me. And, quote, The most worthy of gratitude, who is worshipped for the sake of his face. These texts were a spiritual education from the living God who never dies, the one who guarded me from using weapons against the aggressor. 
He indicates that in the greatest moments of oppression and humiliation, he did indeed feel the urge to raise arms, to fight back, perhaps violently, but he chose not to because, quote, the prophet forbade him. In other words, this was the only way for him, according to his understanding of correct Islamic orthodoxy. I like this because it nuances his character. He wasn't some black and white figure. He didn't consider violence to never be appropriate, but that it was not the answer in this case, or probably in most cases. He had seen enough violence growing up. He had seen how war destroyed families, destroyed people, and even religion. Fighting war and using violence was even detrimental to Islam. It wouldn't lead to the spread of the religion, but to the opposite. It would lead people away from it. He is thought to have said, quote, the scuffles that you lead, you and those like you who attempt to wage holy war, will lead you only to an irremediable loss. Despite this, and strangely in hindsight of course, the French still saw him as too much of a threat and decided to send him into exile, to the jungles of Gabon, where condemned people were often sent with the assumption that they would not survive. They couldn't execute him because that would make him a martyr of course, so this was the best option according to the French. But even though it seemed to calm down his movement at first, it also kind of backfired on them. Today, the day Bamba was arrested and subsequently sent away into exile is celebrated by Murids as a turning point when Bamba started the journey to spiritual perfection. Indeed, the seven years that he spent in the jungles were spent in even more intense spiritual practices which, according to Murids, resulted in him reaching the highest stages of sainthood. In Gabon, he also wrote some of his most famous works of poetry. In short, when Bamba returned to Senegal from exile in 1903, after his followers had negotiated with the French, he was more powerful than ever. The fact that he had survived this exile was seen as almost a miracle, basically, and he started gaining more and more followers, perhaps even more so than before the exile. At the same time, the French had started doubling down on their policy of suppressing all forms of Muslim religious leaders that started amassing followers or that could have any sort of power in that way. Their policy was, quote, to prevent marabouts from creating centers of meeting, religious proselytizing or pilgrimage with a threat of punishment for anyone who did. They had Bamba under constant surveillance, as they still considered him a threat to their power, and because he was still getting more and more powerful, as well as the fact that rumors were continuing to spread among his enemies, and that he sometimes actually did show some resistance and defiance against worldly power, they decided to have him arrested again, only six months after he had returned from Gabon. Once again, Amado Bamba was sent into exile, this time to Mauritania, under the guardianship of a French-friendly Qadri Sufi Sheikh, called Sheikh Sidiya. This exile, which lasted from 1903 to 1907, was very different from the previous one. Here, Amado Bamba spent his time with his fellow Sufis. He was well respected and even started a school to continue his mission of Tarbiya here. It is also said that it was in Mauritania that the Muridiya Sufi order was consecrated fully, as it is here that he is considered to have received the wirid of the order from a vision of the Prophet Muhammad himself. A wird is a kind of prayer cycle that is performed daily by initiates in a Sufi order and which is unique to that order or sometimes even to the individual sheikh. Previously, Bamba had recited the wirds of the Qadri, Shadili and Tijani orders, but now he had a wird of his own, thus completing the formation of the Muridiya into a full Sufi tariqa of its own. Amadou Bamba was allowed to return home to Senegal in 1907 and this time he would stay for the rest of his life. He had spent most of 12 years in exile in total, but could now return triumphantly once again. The French gradually realized that he probably wasn't a threat and became increasingly more accommodating to him and the Murids. Even so, he would spend the rest of his life essentially under house arrest, first in Tien, and from 1912 he was allowed to move to another house in Diorbel, in his native land of Baul. It wasn't Touba, but at least he was home. The last years of Amadou Bamba's life remained intense. He continued his activities of fighting the jihad of the soul and pen, further established his system of education, which was being led in different locations by different sheikhs. The order grew exponentially in this period, more so than it had ever had, and established itself widely across the region. He opened up new places of learning and houses of retreats and Sufi practices. He grew his family and continued to write incredible amounts of poetry.
It is in this period of his life, in 1913, that the only known photograph of the sheikh was taken. This one. It shows Bamba in his characteristic white attire and covering his head and also part of his face. An image that has come to mean a lot to his followers to this day and will often adorn walls on the home of murids around the world. Above all, he never backed down from his non-violent principles and the quest for peace and stability. He fought his jihad for the rest of his days with unwavering commitment to the pacifist path. In the last decades of his life, he was on increasingly good terms with the French, even supporting them in the First World War since he saw them as protecting Muslim lands from invasion. He had always led a movement of resistance, but this resistance was never one of violence or even of overthrowing the government per se. Above all, it was a resistance in support of spiritual and ethical purification, but also to some degree against the colonialist policies of eroding traditional local traditions. He wanted to preserve the spiritual core of society through education and thereby create a more aware population that would in that way resist colonial influence. Not by taking over the government directly or something, but as a gradual transformation of society from the inside, and most importantly, by peaceful means. It is thus not that surprising that Bamba did allow many of his followers to attend French schools and learn the French language, for example. That in itself was not a problem, as long as they also had a stolid spiritual and religious foundation to stand on. For his whole career, he had insisted and tried to reassure the French that he was not interested in trying to raise arms against them, or even interested in worldly politics whatsoever. In perhaps the most forceful and clear statement of his commitment to nonviolence, he stated, quote, Whoever gives even five francs for the sake of God will be compensated. Further, I have agreed to certain conditions with God, such that even if the Mahdi descends to earth, I would not assist him in battle. I will not kill neither scorpion nor serpent nor anything that is living. According to the direction I have taken, it is absolutely forbidden for me to shoot from a weapon, such that even if the Mahdi were to arrive, and if I were to take up arms, my mission would be lost. Bamba says in a poem, quote, O my lord, spare me the harm of all the creatures, and protect them from any harm that may come from me. Bamba sought peace above all, and even in his last years, he assured the French that he and his followers were not interested in creating disturbances. Quite the opposite, actually. Bamba praised the relative peace that prevailed under French rule, which was much preferred to the uncertain times of pre-colonial times, which was characterized by a lot of conflict. He even issued an official fatwa, which made clear his stance, arguing that there was no valid reason at the present time to wage armed jihad, pointing to the specific context in which the Prophet Muhammad had done so, and referring to Islamic law, arguing among other things that the French rule was to be accepted because Muslims were still allowed to practice their religion in the country, and that they, being Christians, belonged to the so-called people of the book. Oh, my Muslim brothers, do not get involved in this so-called jihad, which would only result in human losses and material destruction, not to mention the havoc it would wreak in the country. If you say to me that jihad is prescribed by Islamic law and by sunnah, my response is that it was so in times and circumstances that are different from yours and for people who are different from you. We should treat Christians the way they were treated by Prophet Muhammad. They lived in a peaceful cohabitation without any hostility nor contempt. Thus, he emphasized peaceful coexistence while simultaneously fighting very firmly to preserve and cultivate the Islamic tradition against foreign opposition. In today's world, it is especially interesting to consider that Ahmad Bamba's total commitment to peace and non-violence stemmed directly from his reading and understanding of the Islamic religion and its teachings. Just like someone like Gandhi claimed that he took inspiration from the Hindu Bhagavad Gita in his policies and stances, and Martin Luther King in his civil rights movement looked to the Bible for inspiration, Ahmad Bamba took inspiration in his stands in his non-violent policies, his non-violent jihad in the Qur'an and the examples of the Prophet Muhammad. Ahmad Bamba passed away in the summer of 1927, by then in his 70s, and was buried in his beloved city of Tuba, where a mausoleum and mosque was soon erected and eventually became the largest mosque in all of West Africa. He left behind an immense legacy, Whereas the other Muslim leaders who chose the path of armed resistance were defeated and soon forgotten, Ahmad Bamba's pacifist struggle was, and became, more successful than anyone could have imagined. 
His Murid order had already become a significant religious, economic and social force in the country and would only become even more so as the years went on after his death. Today, it is estimated that about a third of the population in Senegal and the Gambia belong to the Muridia, and they play a major role in the social and even political life of the country. In this way, he was arguably very successful. Many of his closest followers became famous sheikhs even in his own day, and their influence continued after his passing. The most famous of these is probably the very interesting figure called Ibrahim Fall, one of Bamba's earliest followers who became famous and somewhat controversial for his complete devotion to the sheikh. He would be so devoted to serving him, in fact, that he sometimes even neglected some of the basic Islamic rituals, like the daily prayers, which not everyone appreciated, including Bamba himself. Nonetheless, Ibrahim Fall remained a central leader in the Murid community, eventually being a sheikh himself. He emphasized a strong work ethic and service, and a sub-movement within the Muridiyya grew out of his leadership, which became known as the Baifal. The Baifal is still prominent in the region today and is characterized by often wearing patched colorful clothing, dreadlocks, and sometimes intense musical performances. But there were many other sheikhs in the community as well, many of whom were members of Bamba's family. Indeed, after his death, the top leaders of the order, the so-called Khalifas, were essentially a succession of his sons and later his grandchildren. But the order also consists of many sheikhs, teachers and masters of various backgrounds and standings, including of course converts. Because indeed, the Muridiya grew to be one of the largest Sufi brotherhoods in West Africa and eventually the whole world. There are communities of Murids spread all around the globe, from New York to Paris and Stockholm, all of whom trace their spiritual lineage to Amar Bamba and his teachings of education, nonviolence, and peaceful coexistence. As we said earlier, the city of Touba, which was founded by Bamba, is today the second largest city in Senegal after the capital of Dakar. It is also the place of one of the largest pilgrimages in the world. Indeed, every year, millions of Murids around the world travel to Touba to commemorate the arrest and exile of Bamba to Gabon, that event which came to represent his ascension to Chu sainthood, if you remember. It is a massive event in which people come to visit the city, the mausoleum of Bamba, and to celebrate his life, teachings, and poetry. This pilgrimage is known as the Grand Magal and has become one of the most important events or happenings in West Africa, having a major social, political and economic impact on the country. These practices, which make the Muridiya stand out, are fascinating. Aside from all the regular observances that all Muslims perform, like the daily prayers and so on, as well as some of the more specific practices associated with Sufism, the Murids have unique ways of applying the teachings of their master. Bamba's legacy in his order is not only in the general teachings that he conveyed, but also very much in his writings. As we have mentioned, he was a very prolific poet who wrote in Arabic with a proficiency that was unusual for someone from his region. Some of the most famous of these poetic works include the Jawartu and the Maghlaqur Niran wa Mafatihu al-Jinan, or the Locks of Hell and the Keys to Paradise. These poems, or qasida, or qasaid in plural, which express his teachings are incredibly important to the murids and make up a part of everyday practice for them. Indeed, one of the most characteristic practices of the muridiya is precisely the recitation of these poems, which is often referred to precisely as qasaida. In a way, this is the dhikr of the murid order. Dhikr, meaning remembrance, is one of the key practices of Sufism, where the names of God or certain phrases are repeated or recited for extended periods of time, and often in groups. And in the Muridiya, Dhikr often takes the form of Qasaida recitation. Murids will sit in a circle and recite from Ahmad Bamba's poetry with certain melodies. In a way, it is a kind of musical experience, and a very powerful one for anyone who has the privilege to experience it in real life. Just like with dhikr, murids have often told me that reciting the qasida is kind of like a meditation, 
right? They can often sit for many, many hours reciting continuously, and that this is almost like a meditation that you feel refreshed afterwards. If you go to any Murid celebration, especially in places like Tuba and even more especially during the Magal, the pr pilgrimage, you will hear Qasida being recited everywhere. It is a very powerful kind of thing, and it's all pervading in this region. And not just in the sound of the poetry and so on, but also visually. If you visit Senegambia, Senegal or the Gambia, you will find pictures of Bamba, uh, artistic representations of the famous photograph or other representations of events from his life, often painted on houses. You will see Amo de Bamba on houses, you will see him on cars. Um, the photograph of Bamba can also be sort of hanging in a car, he is everywhere, right? Everyone respects him a lot, and the visual image of Bamba is also considered to have a kind of, uh, to contain what is known as baraka in, in Sufi terms, a kind of blessing, right? So you'll see this image uh, everywhere. Uh, the same is true, for example, in popular music. A lot of the most popular artists in Senegal or the Gambia belong to the Murid order. For example, the very famous artist and uh, peace activist Yusuf Ndur uh, belongs to the Murid order, and he even made an album in 2004, I believe, called Santa Yalla, or released internationally as Egypt, uh, which is an album that is dedicated specifically to uh, Amadou Bamba, to the Murid order, and to the Sufi orders and marabouts in, in West Africa in general. It's a beautiful album. It was actually uh, awarded uh, a Grammy award, I think, uh, back then, and it's really worth checking out if you're interested in the topic. In 1960, Senegal declared independence from France and has since formed a very unique political structure. The Sufi orders have, and still do, play a major role in Senegambian society, and this is perhaps especially true for the Mouridia. As I mentioned, leadership of the order has been carried on by Bamba's descendants since his death, and these marabouts have a lot of power and popularity. The Murid order in general is a significant force in society, an economic powerhouse given, for example, their production of peanuts, and a social one because such a large portion of the population are devoted to the marabout. These dynamics has led to the fact that during colonial times, but especially since independence, Senegal and the Gambia has formed a very unique kind of social system, one that is somewhat similar to certain earlier examples from Islamic history, but is very unusual today. In Senegambia, basically everyone in the population is connected to a marabout from one of the four major orders, the Tijaniya, Muridiya, Qadiriya, and the Layen order. The marabouts are not only spiritual and religious guides, but are significant for the social cohesion of the people as well. They can, for example, support their followers financially if someone is in trouble, and other such direct involvement with the people. Thus, even though Senegal, for example, is technically a secular democracy, the government holds a great respect for the marabouts, and they actually play a pretty important role in politics. In fact, the system in this region is one where the secular government is at the top, but then the marabouts function almost like middlemen between the political leaders and the population, representing the religious and spiritual foundation in a mutual relationship. In a way, they thus have a significant level of indirect political influence and power. An example of this is that political candidates often travel to Touba to ask for the blessings of the Murid Marabouts before running, or uh, also sometimes visiting them after winning an election to thank them. This gives the politician legitimacy on a certain level by connecting himself with the religious and ethical teachings of Islam. In the same way, the politicians will in turn often support the Marabouts and their followers monetarily and otherwise, creating a kind of symbiotic relationship. Many political commentators argue that this political system, with a symbiotic relationship between religion and secular politics, is one of the factors behind the, the fact that Senegal has been and remains a relatively very functioning democracy and a stable society in many different ways. It isn't a secular model where there is a complete separation of church and state, like in many other places, which would be very alien to this uh, culture and this, this region, but neither is it a theocratic model like we see in places like Iran. Instead, it's a kind of third option where religion and politics do have a relationship with each other. They, they 
work with each other and they inform each other, but they are also separated in some significant ways. The secular politicians are to some degree at the top, but the religious leaders still play a very significant and important role as kind of intermediaries and, and, and middlemen between these secular politicians and the general population. Senegal has developed its own way of doing things, which seems to be working really well. The religious leaders themselves and the population, most of them want the state apparatus to remain secular, but the fact that the marabouts and religious leaders, the Sufi leaders, still has such an incredible influence and power ensures that religion still plays a very important role in society. According to Leonardo A. Villalon, quote, as well-organized institutions with an extraordinary high degree of popular legitimacy based both on an ideological religious foundation and on their responsiveness to political concerns, the orders have been able to provide Senegalese society with a degree of strength in the interactions with the state, which is virtually unparalleled elsewhere in Africa. A strength that is probably an important factor in how fundamentalist groups seem to find very little foothold in this region, and why, for example, a Christian, Leopold Senghor, could be elected the first president of the country with wide support even from Muslim religious leaders. The figure of Amadou Bamba played no small part in this current landscape in West Africa. His non-violent jihad was arguably a lot more successful than the violent uprisings of some of his contemporaries, and has come to have a major impact on the world. Not only this, but he inspires us to this day with his devotion to peace, his commitment to his religious beliefs, and his general resilience, whether you are a murid or not. If you're interested in more stuff about West African Islam or West African Sufism, you can check out a previous documentary I made about the Tijaniya pilgrimage to the city of Bogal, which takes place annually, which I referred to earlier in this episode. I'll leave a link to that uh, up here somewhere. For now, I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I'd like to thank all of my patrons, as usual, for supporting this channel monetarily, without whom I would not be able to do this. To do all, you know, all these videos require a lot of research, of course. Now, this video was based partly on my own research and stuff that I've researched a long time ago. This has been a subject that I've uh, worked with previously and that I have some experience with. But still, every video takes a lot of work, of course. And so the support of you guys uh, means so much and is invaluable to me. So thank you all so much. If anyone else wants to become a patron, I will leave uh, links to all that stuff in the description and in a pinned comment. But in any case, feel free to leave a comment, like the video, or subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I will see you next time.